Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so welcome, uh, welcome to the bi-weekly QMOP meeting. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Harald Sandvik from the Technical University in Twente. Uh, Harald studied applied physics in Twente and then worked at the uh, Philips Research Laboratories, I believe, until 2005. No, 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 no. much shorter. Much shorter. Uh, okay, uh, 1992. 1999, and then, and then, but in 2005 he became the professor. Yes, correct. Okay, so then, uh, and since then uh, he's been uh, working uh, on uh, quantum, various versions of quantum uh, materials, uh, but uh, he recently had some very nice results on Germany, uh, honeycomb uh, lattice of germanium atoms, uh, and he, uh, where he actually nicely saw topological phase transition, uh, where he will talk about uh, Presentation. Um, Harold, uh, the floor is yours, and uh, we look very much forward to your talk. Okay, thank you, uh, Ima, for the very kind invitation to your presentation here. Of course, Daniel, uh, Christiana, Lumen, it's going to be very nice, uh, very nice uh, to be here. Uh, well, the work about the Germany, and of course, it's not only the work that I did, it's mainly done uh, by my colleagues, but these two students and the other members. Uh, but today I would like to talk about the whole spin hall effect and the electric field induced topological phase transition in, in Germany. Well, let me uh, uh, start with saying that if you have any questions during the presentation, don't hesitate to interrupt me. Yeah? Just feel free to post questions if you have any. Uh, let me start with a very brief introduction. I, I think it's useless over here to do this introduction, but uh, for those who are not so familiar with uh, 2D materials, I guess you all know about uh, graphene. All the atoms are nicely packed together in this uh, chicken wire structure, this honeycomb structure. Each carbon atom has four valence electrons, and three of these electrons are needed to form these nearest neighbor bonds. And then you're left with one electron per carbon atom. Well, these two uh, guys, uh, Kaiman and Ophasolov, they got uh, the Nobel Prize, I think it was 2009 or 2010 or so, because they were the first one to isolate this material. So. They were the first one who made this completely isolated uh, single layer of, uh, of graphene. And this was uh, quite a surprise because from the viewpoint of thermodynamics, you would not expect such a layer to be stable. That's the work of uh, Murren and the Wagner theory. But they show that uh, a one d layer is, uh, is stable. But they got the Nobel Prize, not only because of this uh, successful isolation, but also because of the beautiful property that I, that I had mentioned. And this guy here in the back, well, most of that people know, it's uh, Halbus Halstra, if I'm, uh, if I'm correct. But let's uh, move on. So if you take uh, graphene and you have this, uh, this uh, honeycomb network consisting of carbon atoms, and if you do very basic uh, tight binding calculations, calculations that you can do as a student, you will find that uh, you have these linear bands that cross exactly at the Fermi level. So here, zero refers to the Fermi level. This is uh, the K point, so that's uh, in the uh, Brillouin zone, so one of the corners uh, of, of the hexagon, and you see that you have linear bands, and that means that the electrons in the interfere obey the uh, relativistic variant of the Stradling equation, the so called Dirac equation. Well, this is a very important paper that I would like to discuss. That's the paper from 2005 by uh, Kane and Miller. So I just showed you uh, a minute ago here in the band structure. You can see that here the maximum of the valence band and the minimum of the conduction meet each other. They, they touch each other at the Fermi level. So that would that would imply that the uh, machine is a semi map, two dimensional semi map. Uh, however, if you include steam orbit coupling, you get the opening of the band gap. And then you also see that the bands become parabolic, so that means that the electrons are not really massless anymore, close to, uh, to, this, uh, to this point over here. And Kane and Mella were the first to show that uh, uh, graphene, in principle, should be a very good candidate to exhibit a quantum spin hole effect. And this is due to the fact that you have spin orbit uh, gap, and this gap is inverted if you take the K and the K prime points. And this implies then that. Uh, you will have two topological protected uh, edge states. So I guess most of you are familiar with the normal integer, uh, 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 the normal quantum hole effect. So if you apply a magnetic field and you have a two-dimensional electron gas, then you will find that the electrons form, the, form these, uh, orb these, these, these orbits in the, in the material, but at the edges you have these uh, skipping orbits, and that gives rise to uh, 
uh, an, an ad state with the stock loss going uh, protected, and it's uh, spin degenerate. Well, in the case of the quantum spin Hall effect, you don't need this uh, external magnetic field. Now, the spin orbit coupling uh, acts on the electrons and pushes spin up the electrons and spin down the electrons in opposite directions. So it, it acts as a sort of an internal magnetic field. So you will be able to see this effect without uh, a magnetic uh, field. There is, however, one uh, big uh, drawback. In the case of the theme, the spin orbit uh, uh, coupling is quite weak because it scales with the atomic number to the power of four, and the gap is only of the order of a few microelectron volts. So that implies that if you would like to see this effect in the team, then you have to go to extremely low temperatures. Okay. Uh, but maybe there are other candidates. So if you have a look at the uh, periodic uh, table, and this is the carbon uh, column, and just underneath carbon you have silicon, and then you have germanium, and then you have uh, uh, tin, and these uh, elements are isoelectric uh, to, uh, to, to carbon. So silicon also has four valence electrons, and also germanium has four valence electrons. So maybe you can also make two dimensional materials out of uh, silicon or germanium. And this idea was already been uh, tested, at least uh, uh, by, uh, by theory, by two uh, scientists from Japan, Takeda and Shirachi. They studied the theoretical possibility of having silicon or germanium analogs of graphite, where you simply have layers consisting out of silicon or germanium atoms with a chicken wire structure and then packed together to form a graphite like a structure. And purely based on the uh, theoretical results, they found that this is possible, but already at that point they pointed out that these layers are not completely flat, but a little bit corrugated. They also uh, calculated. Uh, the electronic band structure, and you see that the electronic band structure is very similar to graphene. Also over here, you have linear bands that cross at every level. I have to say that this is still without spin orbit coupling. So these materials are pretty similar to, uh, to, uh, to graphene. And there's another, and that's the last paper that I would like to discuss. This is a very important paper. This is a paper from uh, a Turkish uh, group, a group of uh, Professor Shirazi uh, from Bilkent University. And they, uh, they studied uh, two-dimensional uh, silicon and germanium layers. And of course, then you can have different structures. They consider, consider this structure, where you have the graphene-like structure, which is fully planar, where the two sub-lattices are in the, in the exact same plane. They also consider this buckled case, which is very similar to, I would say, the bulk structure. So the buckling delta here is of the order of a few angstroms. This is basically the bilayer that you have if you have a silicon 111 or a germanium 111 surface. And they also considered a configuration that's basically in between this high buckled configuration and the fully planar configuration. That's the low buckled configuration, so three possible configurations the fully planar one, or the graphene like, uh, the buckled one, which is uh, bulk like, sp3 hybridization, and this one is sp2 hybridization, and a mixed one, sp2, sp3. And if you make a plot then of the energy versus the lattice constants, then you see that for silicon as well as germanium, you have three minima. You have the planar configuration, you have the low buckled configuration, and you have the high buckled configuration. And for silicon as well as germanium, you see that the configuration with the lowest <coughs> energy is the high buckled configuration. Yeah? And this, uh, uh, this, well, this gives little hope to find our uh, uh, CDC or, or Germany because uh, uh, these. Uh, Structures that don't have the lowest energy, but they pointed out, and that makes this paper very important. That is, you have also, if you have to look at the phonon modes, then you will find that these high buckled, uh, high buckled configurations have imaginary phonon modes in a large portion of the Brillouin zone. So that means that layers, single layers, bilayers, as you can see in Germany, uh, with this high buckled, with this high buckled configuration, are not stable, and you have to discard them. And if you discard these high buckled configurations for silicon as well as uranium, what then remains is the low buckled configuration. Uh, so the, uh, after this paper, this paper from 2009, uh, silicene was uh, uh, synthesized for the very first time in 2012 by the group of uh, Dulele and Patrick uh, Foch. And they uh, deposited silicon atoms on a silver 111 substrate and were able to form uh, silicene. Uh, Germany followed a few years uh, later, in 2014, by three uh, different uh, groups. Uh, groups that uh, simply deposited the germanium atoms. Sorry? Sorry, um, I should just clarify. Um, I'm 
not really sure why the um, postponement mode you mentioned would be would mean you to disregard this Sorry. section. I'm not yeah. really sure why the postponement mode you mentioned mean to disregard the um, if you have team engineering phone calls in the last portion of the circuit we run zone, then it means that these structures are not stable. But as a postponement in this uh, layer, in this high bubble configuration, where you have a bilayer or a single layer, uh, if you make it uh, thicker, then uh, you, you don't have this investigative Yeah? Okay. So uh, people that deposit germanium at a fundamental substrate, for instance, people that deposit germanium or platinum 111 or gold 111, well, we use a slightly different uh, procedure, and I will explain that procedure to you in a minute. And in 2015, uh, also uh, STEMI or TENI uh, was synthesized uh, by a group in, uh, in China. Okay. Okay, let me uh, tell you how we, uh, how we synthesize uh, Germany. Because Germany and also silicine, they do not occur in nature. Yeah? So that you have to synthesize or grow these materials. Well, what we do is, uh, is the following. We start off with a germanium substrate, that looks a little bit awkward, and then we deposit platinum, typically about two to three monolayers. And after the deposition of uh, platinum, we do that, of course, in ultra high vacuum uh, conditions, and we anneal the system to a temperature of approximately 1,000 or 1,100 Kelvin or so. Then after cooling down, you will find these structures on the surface. So what you see over here, this is an AFM image of about a, of about a micrometer by a micrometer, we have these uh, clusters. This is a pyramid. This is a flat top cluster. And if you then zoom in on these flat top clusters, you see this honeycomb network. Well, these were experiments that we already did uh, uh, in 2011, 2012 or so. We did not really understand uh, at that time what, uh, what, what, what we had. Uh, but uh, later on, we realized that this is for Germany. So what we did. First, we did uh, spectroscopy, and here again, so let's assume that you have the cone over here, it means that you have linear uh, dispersing bands, and if you combine that with the fact that you have a two-dimensional system, then you can show that the density of states has this V-shaped appearance. So this is the conduction band, this is the valence band, the kernel level is over here, so the density of states should have this V-shape. And if you do, if you measure spectroscopy uh, with, uh, with your STM by using the uh, uh, the uh, STS uh, mode, you can measure the differential connectivity, and this one is proportional to the density states. And you see that you have this V shape in the states, which is one of the hallmarks uh, of a two dimensional New York system. So you were, sorry, you were growing platinum on top yeah. of germanium, and the germanium was coming to the surface. Yeah, and I will explain what, what goes on because the, we found this more or less by accident, uh -huh. and I will show you why it forms, and I will also. Uh, provide you with evidence that we're really dealing with uh, Germany. Okay. And this is not uh, sufficient evidence. This was just a measurement we did. Mm -hmm. uh, but let me tell you about the procedure. Yes. Okay, so what we do, and this is uh, experiments that we took with uh, with a LEE, that's a low energy electron microscope. It's an instrument that gives you information in, uh, in real space as well as uh, reciprocal space. Here the field of view is approximately uh, 10 micrometers. Here the temperature is about uh, 600 centigrade. This is about 100 centigrade. Uh, what we see here in the bottom, this feature over here, this black feature, is uh, uh, damage on our micro channel plate. So this is the signature of the lead from uh, from Twente. So that image you can immediately recognize that it's uh, our lead. Uh, the server is also a little bit contaminated, but it serves a certain purpose. Now we'll come to that in a minute. So there's a little bit of contamination over here, and also a little bit of contamination over here. And what you see on the on the surface, again, field of view about 10 micrometers, you see these uh, black islands. Mm -hmm. And they consist of platinum and germanium. Mm -hmm. uh, after cooling down, uh, this is uh, well, this is approximately 100 centigrade, you see that you have these clusters, still a few uh, clusters left, but you also see these trails. Mm -hmm. Please keep that in mind. <laughs> Next, I'm going to show you a video. And this uh, video is taken at elevated temperatures, and then you'll see what happens on the surface. The video plays uh, back and forth uh, all the time, so here again the damage on the microchannel plate, the contamination, and here you'll see these, uh, these big uh, clusters. And you'll see that at some point, so the temperature is changed from about uh, 600 centigrade to 750 centigrade. You see that at some point these clusters start moving on the surface, and you also that uh, they merge together, they coalesce. Uh, but at least what's important, you see the motion at elevated temperatures. And this is a little bit hard to understand if you assume that these uh, islands or clusters are, are solid, because that means that 
billions of atoms will move in a concerted way. That's, of course, very unlikely. And at, po at this point, we realized that this might be a detecting uh, phase that you have on the surface. Let's have a look at the, uh, at the both phase diagram. So this is the both phase diagram. Over here we have uh, pure germanium, pure platinum. Melting temperature of germanium is of the order of uh, 1200 Kelvin or so. Uh, platinum is way higher. It's about uh, uh, a little bit higher than 2000 Kelvin. And you see over here that you have a detecting point. And this detecting point, that means that if you have a combination that consisting out of 22% uh, platinum and 78% uh, germanium, you have a phase that has a melting temperature that is lower than the melt, melting temperature of germanium and lower than the melting temperature of platinum. Yeah? So this is, makes this detecting uh, phase. Uh, of course, if you deposit platinum on germanium, sir, there's plenty of, uh, of germanium. And if you deposit, let's say, two or three monolayers, you might end up somewhere on this line here, this liquid line. And if you then change the temperature, you will see that, it's, uh, that, 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 that since there is uh, plenty of uh, germanium uh, around, that you move to this detecting point. So what we have over here, sorry, in this video that I showed you, we have these liquid droplets that can move on the surface. And why do they move on the surface? Well, we irradiate the sample from the back with the electrons in order to heat it up. So we uh, well, uh, attempt a small temperature gradient on our surface. The, the hottest place is the center of the sample. And you see that the droplets move in the direction uh, of, uh, of the center. That's where the temperature is highest. So entropy here drives the motion of these uh, atoms. These. The system can simply lower the Gibbs free energy uh, by uh, moving to the hottest place. So we have liquid droplets on the surface. So we have a detecting phase. But let's assume that you're in this detecting point, And if you then go lower in temperature, you get spinal decomposition. So you get phase separation into the two phases that are immediately adjacent to the detecting point. That is pure germanium and germanium 2 platinum. That is what would uh, occur. So uh, and this is also what we uh, and so this is what we have at temperatures higher than the eutectic temperature. We have the eutectic droplets on the surface. This is a liquid, this is solid. And if you go to temperatures below the eutectic temperature, you get uh, this phase separation into germanium to platinum and germanium. And we think that germanium segregates to the surface and forms a germany. That's what we think. So let's, uh, let's have a look at some, uh, some more evidence for this. So this is the picture that we have. This is germanium substrate, germanium 110. We have our clusters, which consist out of germanium 2 platinum, uh, probably coated with, uh, with Germany, with germanium. Uh, this is, uh, again, uh, AM images I already showed you uh, before. The first thing that we did is electron backscattering the diffraction on these uh, clusters. Uh, we did that on the, on the better substrate, and then you see this pattern uh, with all these uh, Kikuchi lines. And if we compare that pattern with the pattern that you would expect for a germanium 110 surface that's shown over here. So the red lines over here show the pattern that you have for uh, germanium uh, uh, 110. You see that the agreement is, is very good. But this is, of course, we already knew that before because that's the sample that we ordered. And that's the sample that we mounted in our system. Uh, we also took uh, these, uh, these uh, 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 Kikuchi line uh, patterns on the, on the cluster. So this is uh, the cluster. You see that you have a pattern that is totally different from, uh, from the substrate. And then we took all the different phases that you have in the both phase diagram. So pure germanium, pure platinum, germanium to platinum, uh, germanium platinum, germanium platinum two, and so on and so forth. And there is only one which gives a perfect agreement. And that's only germanium to platinum. So we see that we have a perfect agreement be, be, uh, with this uh, pattern, with the Kikuchi lines between uh, what we expect and, uh, and our observation. So we're very, very sure that these clusters consist out of such an Good. Uh, the top layer is uh, formed this uh, honeycomb uh, structure. And the first layer uh, on the germanium 2 platinum, of course, hybridizes with uh, underlying substrate. And uh, this one is what we call electronically dead. It's very similar to the system, uh, uh, silicon carbide system. If you have silicon carbide and you uh, want to uh, grow uh, uh, between layers on silicon carbide, what you do, you bring the crystal to elevated temperatures. You have the uh, silicon that uh, 
that uh, uh, that that uh, you evaporate basically the silicon, and what is left is uh, is carbon, and that forms uh, uh, graphene. But the first layer is ultimately dead. That's also in our case. So. Uh, what you see over here are a few layers. So this is the, the first layer. This is uh, is the buffer layer, not so visible. This is the first layer, the second layer, and the third layer. And if you then zoom in uh, with STM, you will find this uh, this honeycomb structure over here. And you also see that in this honeycomb structure, you see that one of the sub lattices sits in a higher position. So if we take a hexagon over here, you can see that three atoms sit in a high position, and the other three atoms sit in sit in a lower position. And this buckling is typically on the order of 0.4 inches or 0.3, 0.4 inches. Uh, the lattice concept is about 4.2 inches. That's also what you would expect for, uh, for German. And the big advantage over here, compared to the other methods, is that here we have no intermixing. Uh, because the germanium is expelled. Uh, if you <coughs> go back to this uh, both phase diagram, and you have this final decomposition, and you go to the germanium 2 platinum phase, well, all the platinum is needed to form the germanium to platinum, and the excess germanium is expelled to the surface. So, no intermixing. Okay, then uh, let's uh, move on. So, what we have is we have this uh, this honeycomb network. We know that it's coupled. So, that one sub lattice sits in a higher position than the other sub lattice. That is also what theory predicts. Theory predicted that if you have a German E layer, it should be bubbles. That's what we observe. But of course, I have to, uh, to tell you that the spin orbit coupling in this material is uh, way larger than in, uh, in, uh, in uh, graphene. So uh, you have the simple tight binding calculations where you have the linear bands that cross at the Fermi level. But of course, if you include spin orbit uh, coupling, you open a gap. And the bands, of course, are not perfectly uh, linear all, uh, here. So that means that you have uh, all the electrons become massive in the vicinity of the K and the K Okay, so this is uh, maybe a candidate to exhibit uh, the quantum spin hole effect. And as I said, if there's no spin orbit coupling, it's a truly uh, semi metal. But uh, due to the spin orbit coupling, you have the opening of a gap. And you have to keep in mind that these bands are inverted. So uh, you have a pseudo spin here and a pseudo spin here that are identical. And that's also holds for a spin engine. Mm -hmm. Yes? Doesn't the fact that you have the buckling, this induces a mass, and your bands, instead of being linear, they, shouldn't they be parabolic? Yeah, they become parabolic. Yeah, so the but bands even are before are opening the gap. <coughs> Sorry? Even before opening the gap. Uh, when there is no spin orbit coupling at all? Uh, yes, because be... you have the mass, uh, the buckling. I well, if you, the if buckling you, would make it um, parabolic already. You think so? Yes. Okay, I'm not 100 percent sure. Could be, but uh, at least when you when you have a spin orbit uh, coupling, it's not uh, mm -hmm. you know, it's not linear. Okay, so the first thing that we did is uh, we did spectroscopy. This is a flake, a uh, Germany flake, a first layer of flake on a buffer layer. We took a spectroscopy here in the center of the flake and at the edge of the flake. Here's the differential conductivity, which is proportional to the density of states. And what you see in the black curve, you see the gap. So you have a well-defined gap in the interior of the material. Um, but if you move towards the edge, that's the red point over here, you see that you have a non-zero density of states, close to the perimeter, in the gap region. So you see a distinct difference uh, between, uh, between the edge and the interior of the material. OK, this is the spatial uh, map. So, uh, the uh, state quickly vanishes if you move away from, from the edge that's shown here in, in the red curve. So uh, the peak quickly vanishes typically a few nanometers away from the, uh, from the state that's completely gone. And the blue line is just a topography uh, line. OK, so if you make, uh, this is a topographic uh, uh, image. And here we have maps of a differential conductivity taken at different voltages. All in the uh, in the gap region, you see that you have a well-defined edge state. But if you move away from this uh, gap region, you see that the edge state also disappears. Okay. Uh, here we uh, a few more images. If we zoom in on uh, one of the edges, here the edge is not uh, perfectly straight. Here you have the hexagonal structure. Here you only see one of the two sub lattices. Also over here, so it's also hexagonal. But you see that the edges are not straight. 
But despite the fact that the edges are not straight, if you have a look at the differential conductivity, you can see that you have a well-defined edge state. And it does not really depend on the exact orientation of the edge. Oh, okay. So why does the, why do you get these intensity modulations in the edge state? Yeah, I will come I will come to that. Uh, well, if you have an uh, edge, you have different uh, kind of terminations. Uh, so you have cyclic edges, you have armchair edges. And of course, if you have a look at your projection of your cyclical uh, 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 lattice uh, in the uh, uh, zigzag direction or in the armchair uh, direction, you get uh, different <laughs> velocities and that gives also rise to, 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 to different peaks. Right. So you see a very well defined uh, peak for a zigzag edge. And this is way flat before an arch edge. Mm -hmm. yeah, so there is, uh, but I will come to that. Uh, let's first have a look at, uh, at the theory. So this is uh, the semi metal, uh, the band structure, is there no spin orbit coupling. Here, if we uh, include spin orbit coupling, you have the inverted gap over here. And now we should have a look at the uh, dispersion relation. Let me explain what, uh, what we have over here. This is, of course, the linear band that you already know. Delta is the buckler. Yeah, so that is displacement between the two sub lattices. E C is the uh, electric field that you apply, uh, and then here we have the spin orbit coupling, and of course you have the the, uh, the uh, spin degeneracy and the value degeneracy, which can either be uh, both be uh, plus or minus one. So uh, now let's assume that we uh, switch on uh, an electric uh, field. We do that here in the direction normal to the Germany sheet. And you see that the spin up and the spin down bands, which are green or orange, respond in a different way to the applied field. So let's say that the green is spin up and uh, uh, red is uh, spin down. You see that the gap due to the electric field for the spin up becomes uh, smaller, and for the spin down it becomes larger. And this is just inverted at the, at the, at the other point. So there is a asymmetry between the K and the K prime. It all follows immediately from this expression you have. Uh, but what's important to point out, there's of course only this effect if you have buckling. So in the case of uh, graphene, you have no buckling, so delta is zero, and then you don't have this effect. You only have this effect due to the broken symmetry. And if you crank up the field to make the field larger and larger and larger, then at some point the gap here closes. This is for the spin up, and here the spin down band uh, closes. Then the material converts from a two dimensional topological insulator to a semi metal. And if you then make the field even stronger, the gap reopens, but then the material becomes a normal band insulator. So we have a transition here from a topological insulator to a normal band insulator as a function of the, uh, of the electric field. Yeah? And as I said, it all follows from uh, this expression here for the uh, for the uh, Okay. Let's have a look at uh, what we see in the interior of the material. Good. So what we do, this is uh, Germany, this is the interior of the material, we, we bring an STM tip uh, pretty close uh, to the substrate, and the first thing is, of course, we have to apply this electric field. Well, what we do in order to apply the electric field, of course, there's a voltage difference between the tip and the, and the substrate, but this voltage is uh, usually pretty small, but you have to keep in mind that these two materials have a difference in work function. I will show you in a minute that the work function of Germany is of the order of four electron volts. And here we have a uh, metallic tip, platinum iridium tip, or, uh, or a tungsten tip. We take a platinum iridium tip, the work function is of the order of 5.5 electron volts. So that means that here we have uh, a difference in work function of approximately 1.5 electron volts. The distance is of the order of a nanometer. That means that you have a very strong electric field underneath your uh, ingress to energy. Okay, well, uh, what do we see? Of course, uh, we see something if we vary the field. So uh, let's start that we start with a field of 1.6 volt per nanometers. You see that you have a gap. That's the red line over here. If we then increase the field by bringing the tip closer to the substrate, you see that the gap gets smaller. This is 1.76 volt per nanometers. If it's even larger, you see that the gap completely closes. Now it's a semi metal. Then we're dealing with this configuration. And if we make the field even larger than that uh, critical value, it reopens again, and now it becomes a normal band insulator. I will provide you with more evidence in a minute, but first I would like to, uh, to explain to you how we determine the work function of Germany, because this value is not known. 
and it's sort of critical to it's very critical to know this value of the charity. Well, we do that with uh, also with uh, with SDS, which is basically uh, spectrum spectroscopy. We make use of uh, so-called uh, field emission resonances, Kundla oscillations. What we do, this is the band diagram, so the Fermi level is over here, this is the work function over here, this is uh, our substrate, and then here we have our tip, and we bring the Fermi level of the tip uh, above the vacuum level. Okay? That means that if you inject electrons from your tip into your, uh, into your substrate, they end up at energy uh, energies above the vacuum level. There are no states to uh, to turn to. So what basically you will uh, form here is a triangular shaped well, and you get these confined states in this in this well. So that, these are the field emission resonances, and you can measure these resonances. And if you measure these resonances, you can extract very accurately the absolute value of the work function. Well, we did that for uh, for two uh, two materials. Uh, we started with uh, germanium. Germanium uh, 001, and it's, uh, and you see that it's uh, this one, the top one, you know the work function of germanium, it's approximately 4.5 dB, and here we have these uh, Gundlach oscillations. Uh, you see these well defined oscillations corresponding to the standing waves that you have in this triangular well, and you see that they nicely collapse onto this uh, straight line. What we do, we plot the energy as a function of, well, uh, n to the power uh, uh, two thirds. Uh, and of course, there's a little effect on the set point uh, current because uh, if you bring the tip a little bit closer to the substrate, creates a tunneling current, and of course you make this well a little bit steeper, so the values will shift a little bit. But it's nicely, uh, uh, nicely fits with what theory predicts. And in the case of uh, germanium, we extract a work function of 4.5 dB. That's exactly the value that is also reported in the literature for uh, germanium. And uh, we measure work which is way lower. It's, low, it's even lower than uh, four electron volts. It's about uh, 3.8 electron volts. And this is extremely helpful for our experiments because that means that in this case we have a substantial difference in work function between our Germany substrate and the tip. And that allows us to apply the electric field because the electric field of a few volts per nanometer is a very, very strong electric field. Okay, but I have to provide you with a little bit more. Uh, a little bit more evidence. So which material is the tip? Uh, platinum iridium, platinum. tungsten, but also we also coated the tungsten with gold and with platinum. We, we use different kinds of tips, different methods. Okay. Okay. Uh, well, this is uh, this is an important uh, important slide. Uh, so what we did now, we did the spectroscopy, not only in the interior of the material. I already showed that uh, to you, but also at the edge. The black curve is what we recorded at the edge, and the red curve is recorded at the edge of the middle. This is for the electric field smaller than the critical field, and then you see that you have a gap in the interior, and you have a non-zero density of states at the edges. So here we have a two-dimensional topological in insulator, and now if we increase uh, the field, and you see that at some point at the critical field, you get this V-shaped density of states, then the material is two-dimensional semi-metal. We still have our metallic uh, edges over here. And if you make the field even larger, larger than the critical field, then you see that the edge states in the red curve, they disappear. So you don't have edge states anymore. And you uh, and the gap in the book opens again, reopens again. So this phase transition, uh, which is already uh, predicted uh, uh, 10 years ago or so, is now uh, is measured and we also I believe that this is, uh, supports uh, our uh, uh, conclusion that we're dealing with topological protected states. So you see that these topological protected states disappear the moment the gap reopens. Okay, good. Uh, this is what you, uh, what you basically expect. So here is the uh, electric field. This is the gap that you measure. And the gap that we measure, I have to say, is uh, larger than what theory uh, predicts. So we have a spin orbit uh, coupling. Our spin orbit gap, I should say, that is uh, larger than what theory predicts. Theory predicts approximately 25 to 30 milliEV or so. We measure about uh, 50 milliEV. But you see that with increasing electric field, the gap first closes and then reopens again. Here we're dealing with a two dimensional topological insulator that for fields smaller than the critical field and for fields larger than the critical field, it becomes a band insulator. Well, we use, of course, the different uh, tips, uh, both uh, coated. Uh, 
or a tip that was uh, coated with gold or with platinum. And of course, we, we could not cover the full range of, uh, of, of uh, from, from uh, all the way from zero to, to three volts per nanometer or so. We could only cover the range from approximately 1.4 volts per nanometers to 2.4 volts per nanometers. And this phase transition occurs approximately at 1.9 volts per, uh, per nanometer. Okay, so what uh, what we have over here is, is this Sorry. Screen. You said our gap is larger than what theory predicts. Yes. But maybe theory is just making an approximation around the direct point. Could be. And your data around the direct point yes. seems to be, Could very well be agreeing with yeah. the theory. Yeah. But if you take the entire band, it your could be theory, larger. yes. Could be, yeah, could be. Uh, okay, uh, what we have over here, so uh, just to, to show you uh, what, what goes on if we change, change the electric field. So this is uh, a field just below uh, the critical field. Here you see that uh, that you have this uh, topological protected head state. You see that it's clearly visible over here. If we make the field a little bit larger, to 2.3 volts per nanometer, the state head state disappears. You're dealing with the trigger band insulator. And here we lower the field again. It uh, shows up again. It reappears. And here we go up again, and then it uh, disappears again. So we we'll allow, basically, by playing with the electric field, to switch this topological protected mode on and off. Yeah? And that makes that, basically, we can make a, a, a topological field effect transition. The results uh, have been published in, uh, in PRL and then uh, even appeared on, uh, on the cover. But uh, the important thing is that we, uh, that with this approach, we can make this uh, topological field effect transistor. So where you have an external electric field to change the quantum state of matter from two-dimensional topological insulation with topological protected head state to a state where it has a, has a band where it's a trigger band insulator. Uh, but the, the drawback is, of course, that we only have two of these uh, topological protected head states or spin polarized. Uh, but maybe there's a way to, to increase the number of uh, topological protected head states. Uh, for that, I would like to, uh, to have a look at the uh, some of our other uh, data, and uh, yes, uh, I told you that you have these uh, clusters over here uh, that are clusters, they take, take uh, uh, droplets that if you pull down, you get this final decomposition and on these clusters you will find Germany, but you also have these trails. These trails consist out of germanium that is expelled during the process when you pull down, you know, because you have to get rid of germanium some of the germanium remains on, on, on the surface of, uh, of the solidified crystal, but there's also a trail of germanium atom that is left behind. <coughs> and these, we believe that these are uh, uh, germanium uh, nanoribbons. Let me show you some STM results. These are these, uh, these, uh, these trails. If you zoom in on these trails, you know, a little bit higher resolution. So here, they, this is about, uh, well, 300 nanometers or so by 400 nanometers. Here we zoom in a little bit. These are the nanowires. And if you zoom in a little bit more, you can see that you have many of these uh, ribbons. They are uh, probably a, a, a zigzag uh, termination. So that makes them uh, very, very appealing. So if you uh, do spectroscopy on these uh, wires, we have to say they should not be too thin. If the wires get very, very thin, then we see that we don't have a metallic edge state. But over here, and this one is about uh, four or five nanometers uh, wide. The black curve is recorded in the center of the nanowire, and you see that you have a well-defined gap. And if you move towards the edge and you do spectroscopy, you see that you have a well-defined peak. And it's, a, it's also a type of peak that you would expect for a zigzag edge, a very, very pronounced peak that shows up very close to the front Okay. Uh, so this is a spatial uh, map, and here you see the, uh, the states, the edge states. This is this side, the other side is a little bit weaker. That's from over here. And this is basically the distance measured in this direction. Okay, and these edges are also robust. Uh, here we have an example. This is topography. This is a, a map of differential connectivity. It's uh, taken, uh, of course, in, in, in the gap region, in the bulk gap region. And then you see that most, almost all of these edges uh, are very, very bright. Here, for instance, you see that an edge changes its direction a little bit, but despite the fact that the edge changes its uh, direction a little bit, there is still a pronounced edge state. So the edge states are robust. Okay. 
And uh, in this way, we can increase the number of topological protected uh, states that you have. And this would also be very appealing uh, uh, for, uh, for the realization of topological field mechanisms. Good. That brings me to the uh, to the end of my talk. I would like to thank the people that uh, did uh, almost all of the work. Uh, so Pantelis Pantelis is uh, very instrumental in this. Uh, he was a PhD student in 2011-12 that did the first uh, measurements. After his PhD, he went to, to Germany, to Hanover, and also to Cologne. But recently, he returned to uh, to Twente. He is now a tenure tracker in uh, in, in Twente. Uh, the PhD students, especially Caroline, I have to mention here, she is the one uh, who started with the experiments. That's, uh, uh, I think, five, year, five or six years ago. She already graduated some time ago. Uh, Dennis Klaas is, is uh, the current uh, PhD student that works on the, on the nano ribbons. Yellow Camille is a master student. He already finished his uh, master's. We also had uh, collaborations. Uh, this is uh, Dr. Gudenko, Alexander Gudenko, from the group of uh, Kars Nielsen, Nijmegen. From Beijing, uh, Yu-Gi-Oh! and Professor uh, Leo. And in Japan, we had a collaboration with uh, Monihiko Isawa. And this uh, brings, me, brings me to the end of the show. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Harold, for a nice and clear presentation. We've had a few questions, but we have time for a few more. Yes, please. So maybe it's a simple question. So I'm wondering why you use Germany, so why not the stemming or even black phosphorine? Because we have to buck up more and then higher is more the copy. Yeah, so uh, stemming would also be an option. Uh, the reason that we, uh, that, that we study Germany that simply has to do with the fact that we found this by accident. So we did the experiment. It was not our goal to synthesize Germany. Now let me explain why we study this system. So in the past, uh, we studied the formation of uh, uh, nanowires, uh, atomic wires on semiconductor surfaces, so platinum, for instance, platinum or gold wires on uh, germanium substrates, and we always use uh, germanium 001. The germanium 001 is diamond reconstructed, but you have two different domains that are orthogonal to each other. So we found always uh, uh, why it's running in one direction on one terrace and on the next terrace they were rotated by 90 degrees. And this is of course not very beneficial if you want to do, for instance, photo emission experiments or microscopic experiments. And then we said, okay, we should take a surface that is anisotropic of itself and germanium 110 is anisotropic. And then we have the idea, oh, we deposit platinum, maybe we, would, we, we can form these wires on the germanium 110. And then we found these clusters. We didn't understand that. Pantelis was so clever to do uh, lots of experiments at that time. We were on a computer. And then a few years later, we realized, oh, it might be uh, Germany. Uh, and that came, I have to admit, because of the lean measurements that we did. The moment that we saw that these uh, clusters start to move, we realized oh, this must be uh, it must be a liquid phase. It must be an detective phase. We immediately looked at uh, both phase diagrams and found this detective point. That was the starting point. But uh, other groups work, 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 for instance, on, on uh, standing. And that's indeed a better choice if you would focus on, 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 the, on the size of the uh, spin over gap, because the spin over gap in standing is uh, much larger than in Germany. And in phosphorine. Yeah, it would also be uh, yeah, yeah, it also be a good choice. Uh, could you maybe uh, sketch a little bit? This is Germany, all by coincidence, but there are other people making by purpose Germany, by CBD, on dedicated substrates. They yes. found this quantum spinal effect also? No. Uh, if you take all the papers that have been pub published on Germany, and there are different groups that work on Ger Germany, none of the group groups observe this uh, local honeycomb structure. They always observe higher order uh, uh, structures because you have an underlying substrate and then they don't see that this, you have this, this, this well-defined local effect. But that, for instance, one out of the six atoms in the hexagon sits in a higher position and then you get a square root tree or square root tree structure. This, we, I think we are the only ones who observe the local honeycomb. So, if you think 
but in the other churches which are only a little bit different, to, that's enough to to not accept the the Mother's Men or, or they don't find the edges maybe. Well, they have not done the experiments. Okay, they don't. They have, uh, that's, that's even the if you check the literature. The yeah. okay. Even if you check the literature, there is, I think, one exception. That is from the group of Hong Yong Lao uh, in Beijing, Institute of Physics. They grew germanine um, copper 111, and then the first layer is electronically catagant because it hybridizes with the underlying substrate. Then, if they grow the second layer, they find. Uh, also a V-shaped density of states, very similar to what we found. So they also have indications that it's a two-dimensional Dirac system, but they didn't do the study that we did. But what is, of course, important here? Well, we need finite size crystals. Uh, yeah, you, 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 need, you need to have edges, of course, in order to, to see the effect. Um, uh, but um, uh, uh, what was the thing that I want to say? Uh, What's very important to, to point out here is that you need basically two things. You, if, you, if you compare the material with the thing, you need to have a large spin over to copper, that's one. So you have a large spin over gap. And also the buckling is, is very important here because with the buckling, we could show that we could switch this yeah, top yeah, to on and off. And if that's you don't have the buckling, that's then that's you can also have high density of states. And that's just because of, there are many other reasons why you can have high density of states. An idea to explain the strong and other coping that theory, of course, theory can be, can be very nicely wrong in that. Yeah, but we can also but but, it. Yeah. But, but you have traction underneath. Yeah. And that means that with uh, the proximity effect, you can end it a little bit more. Could be, but then you, yeah. But the thing is that uh, then you would expect a, a large effect in this uh, electronic dead layer because that, that's not a very interesting layer for us. but. Already the first layer, the distance between the platinum and the second layer is already quite large. And for this proximity effect, you need some overlap of, of the wave function. So we thought of this, but it's maybe not so likely that it comes from, 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 from the proximity with the platinum. Um, as Cristiano mentioned, yes. Buckling introduces also a seven-act mass, or mass yes. that, that carries the system, but it's a Trivial, yeah. trivial gap by itself, but it could maybe mm -hmm. also account for what this larger mm -hmm. okay. gap size could yeah. very well be. Yeah. 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 Okay. yeah, could be, could be, uh, could be. You could measure buckling as you change the size of your nano ribbon by checking how which magnetic field you need to close the gap. Uh, electric field. Yes, electric yeah. field. We could do it. We haven't done these experiments. Uh, and uh, of course, you also need sufficient resolution yeah. uh, to measure the buckling. Because yes. the buckling is, 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 is tiny. It's only. No, uh, no, no. Don't need to measure the buckling. Just you only measure electric the electric field. field yes, that's, and that's by estimating the electric yeah. field, we that know the be, buckling. Yeah. 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 Because be, if the sure. buckling is smaller, yes. then the, you, uh, with the less field, yeah. you could uh, yeah. close the gap. So, yeah. But the so, other question I had. Yes. What's the following? When you observe the regions where you have your nanoribbons, do you see crossing nanoribbons? Regions where they cross? No, because, because all the nanoribbons are basically they are aligned parallel. along the high symmetry direction of the crystal. They are all parallel. Yeah. There are no defects where no. they would. Cross. No, of course, you have sometimes ribbons that are not perfectly straight in the sense they are aligned along mm -hmm. this long direction, and sometimes they get a little bit wider. Mm -hmm. That's the only variation we have in the nanoribbons, but, no but not the orientation. The orientation is coupled to the to the underlying substrate. We always find these nano ribbons in the trails. Mm -hmm. So this, these droplets move across the surface, and when they cool down, the mm -hmm. germanium is expelled, excess germanium is expelled, leaves behind a trail of germanium, mm -hmm. and then we find the uh, the, uh, the, the ribbons. Yes, I have a couple of more technical questions. Yes. Uh, first one is what are the typical junction systems? The typical traction resistances that you use in order oh, to uh, have the field is significant. Uh, okay, what the uh, typical distance is of the order of let's say a nanometer or eight angstroms or so, and then we apply voltage. Is what you see that on the XS, uh, on, on the axis that there is, uh, let's say between uh, point uh, plus or minus uh, 0.3 volts. Uh, yeah, and then uh, what would it be? Yeah, I have to calculate yeah, it, yeah, but, but it's typically in the range of. Uh, uh, people and uh, 
Jeffrey Lowe and Anaheim, I was going to say, and then uh, uh, point three. So quite small. Uh, well, uh, I would say quite, quite high uh, thermal resistance uh, because it's uh, nano amps and volts, so oh, 10 to the 9. So uh, it's uh, okay. typically uh, in order of gigaohms. Okay, very good for the yes. And the second question is related. So you were showing this slide where you had the uh, 2.3 volt nano yeah. and 1.9 volt. Yeah. So do you actually see the H mod at uh, like what what's the range of uh, electric field? That you have, the where you can actually see the edge yeah, Is there a range or is it specific value? There, uh, there is, uh, you see them. Let me go back to this, uh, to this overview. Uh, this, uh, yeah, this, this one. So here's the electric field. Here it's varied between 1.6 volts per nanometers up to 2.4. Uh, then you see that in this range, where it's blue, we have the top loss of transistors, and if we exceed this field of approximately 1.995 volts per nanometer, then they disappear, and then the trivial gap opens. Here it's gap. Here it's also gap, but here the gap is not mm -hmm. But they're only present in this range, and we can we can go a little bit lower, but we cannot go to an electric field of uh, uh, a few tens uh, of volts per nanometer. We can always observe the edge in that range. Yes, in that blue uh, region. Okay. Yeah. Okay. The energy range of your edge state was in the bulk band cap, but it was quite a broad range of energies. Is yeah. still coupling to bulk states from the edge? To, uh, of, course, of course, that could be. So what, what, what you mean over here, uh, you yeah. see you have this picture, for instance. Yeah, the oh, this, you this one. Sort of the, the okay, what, okay. Sort of that. let me explain what, what you see over here. Okay. So uh, this is this. Uh, the black line is the gap, the gap that you have over here. And of course, these bands also have a, a certain dispersion, so they have a certain Fermi velocity, which is determined by here the width of the gap and the separation between the k and the k prime point. And I draw these ones as straight lines. Uh, if you take the ET calculation, then people show that it's not a perfectly straight line because at some point this line has to. Uh, well, it merges with these bands over here, so they become a little bit flatter. Yeah? But you also have to, to, to uh, keep in mind that it's at the end. Uh, so if this is along the edge, here in the center, this is the gamma point, right? And with STM, you're very sensitive to the density of states at the gamma point. And if you move away uh, from this, uh, this crossing point over here, and uh, you move in this direction, and also in this direction, so you, you change the energy or you go up in energy, you get a different parallel momentum, and that means that the current really drops a lot. And that is also visible, for instance, better visible, I think, in uh, in this one, Nanorin space. Yeah, you see that you have a very pronounced peak, mm -hmm. uh, and it falls off quite rapidly. Part of the of the fact that it falls off so rapidly comes due to the fact that you move away from the gamma point. Yeah. And of course, you can model this all. That's also uh, what we did. We work on that. But the shape, you can you, you can explain the shape of uh, of, uh, of of the, the peak very well. And of course, now in this case, this one is in the gap, and there's not uh, well, it will not probably not hybridize with the both bands. But at some point, it gets so wide because purely theoretical, it should be constant density of states. Yes, but it's, it's not something that you will measure with your SDM yeah. because of this effect. If you have a linear dispersion relation, 1D, it should be constant density of states. But with STM, you also have to take into account that if you move away from the gamma point, K parallel becomes larger, and then the contribution to the current drops. So rather than having a flat density of states, you will measure a peak and that phase away. Yeah? Is that fair? Another final question. Maybe very naive comment here on this slide. 
it appears that there is a bit of an asymmetry yes, of the energy that we have today. Yes, yes, yes. 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 Uh, like you said, due to the different electrostatic environment uh, that the nanobrains experience? Or, well, Could be. We don't know. But that's something that we have uh, observed more frequently. Actually, I have to say the results on the nano rivets, yeah, we still have to analyze lots of measurements that we did. Yeah. And we do not have a clear picture yet. One of the things that I would like to, to briefly point out is that if you make the nano rivets too thin, and actually Wim and, and Christiana work on that, we see that the edge states disappear, probably due to hybridization. And then what only uh, we see something at the, at the beginning and the end of the nano wire. You know, we have these end states. But the reason for the asymmetry, no, we, we don't know. It could be public to, yeah. to, 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 to the neighborhood. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, let's thank Harold again for a nice question.